time virtualization. So you unchecked the GUI, right? I, I left it there. Um, if, you, if this were a production machine, I would not install the GUI. I would not install the GUI, but I would install the Vert Manager on a uh, laptop or workstation and uh, use it to connect over uh, HTTPS to the, uh, the Zen RPC system. So I'm just doing that because I don't have a separate workstation to do so. So yeah, we do the, the dependency packages, et cetera, et cetera, and then we do the normal install. Once it goes through its normal install, we will get a system, as soon as it shuts down, that we can boot that will be running is in kernel. Talking about Zen, um, like I mentioned, there are two different types of Zen kernel or, or domain. You've got the DOM0 or domain0. This is the privileged account. So what we did in those steps just now as we walked through the installer, we were installing Zen and our DOM0. If we were to look at it in a graphical representation, the hardware would be on the bottom level. And you'll notice here in just a moment when we finish with all the BIOS stuff, you'll see a little figlet drawing of the Zen logo and uh, a bunch of Zen lines fly past your screen, that's actually the hypervisor. So you see these lines here, that is your hypervisor starting, that is Zen. When you get to this point, you're now booting the DOM0. So you've got hardware, Zen, and your DOM0. That is the basis you need in order to run both para-virtualized and fully virtualized guests. Have you seen any, or what kind of performance increase have you seen going from a single core CPU to a dual core to a quad core? I haven't done anything really serious with single core. Uh, the very first box, just a little history of Neverblock. Uh, this, this is a good, good question, but a little history of Neverblock. It started out as uh, Derek got tired of his Comcast connection dropping and his website being down. At which point he decided, you know, I'm going to spend $700, buy a box from Dell, uh, bought the cheapest box. I, I minimized all of the options. Uh, so I had a single dual core processor, uh, I think it was two gigs of RAM, and the smallest disk I could get. And I threw it up at uh, X Mission, co-located it, and started playing with it. And I, I, looked at the, I looked at this uh, Zen stuff, and I was like, hey, that's kind of cool. So I installed Zen. I saw a big improvement from, uh, well, there were two things I changed from the first box I installed, which was a small machine, to uh, all of the subsequent nodes, which have been pretty much identical to this machine. Uh, the biggest, the two biggest changes were we increased the RAM immensely, and we started using uh, quad-core machines versus dual-core machines, and we uh, were using Zen 3 as opposed to Zen 2, 6, whatever it was. Um, so I didn't really do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. So take that as, as what it's worth. But on this one U machine with, I think we upgraded it to four gigs of RAM. We have currently eight machines, and this is still running Zen 2.6. And each of them run well, but we can't put anything else in there. So there's eight machines on this little guy, and they're chugging along beautifully, 
but we're not able to put anything else because when we start other machines, then the performance starts to degrade. I don't know if that's a problem with Zen 2 or if that's a problem with just having a single dual core processor. Because all the other machines, and we went from two processors to eight processors essentially, and we went from Zen 2 to Zen 3. Uh, we have currently, uh, we have 10 virtual machines on one of our nodes and five on another. So the machine with 10 nodes, I mean, it's not even breaking sweat right now. We, we, we haven't noticed any performance degradation at all. And that's, that's our busier customers as well. Um, uh, just recently, uh, I mentioned Joseph Hall. Uh, he got uh, dug the other day uh, for one of his cooking tutorials. And uh, in the middle of this, his former host just up and closed his account. You've exceeded CPU. I don't remember who it was, but he's, he called me up and said, uh, you know, I need a new server. What, what can you do for me? And uh, I put him on uh, Neverblock with our, our, our minimum system. And he went just fine for a little while until he got uh, on the front page of Gig. And then he ran out of RAM. None of our other customers were affected, but his machine was having out of memory errors. So we upped his RAM, his RAM allotment, and his machine ran just fine. There was no adverse effect on all of the other guests on the machine. But his was getting hammered. So we can see, we've seen a lot of traffic. There was, and he'll have to tell you the numbers. There was a large number of, of hits per second. How much RAM did he need to survive that bit? We upped him to 756. So he had, I think it was 256, and uh, Apache can work with 256 megs of RAM with the stock configuration. It's not happy. <laughs> um, so we, we temporarily uh, spotted him some extra RAM just to see. We, we were more curious as to whether or not you know how 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 slowly could we up the stuff before before he started working? We upped it uh, once to 512. He went for a little while, and then started uh, filling up RAM again. And then we went to 756. And never saw the problem. Do you have to shut down the virtual machine to upgrade the RAM? Yes and no. If you do things properly and uh, provision all your machines with uh, balloonable RAM. You can balloon the machine to RAM, and uh, that, that's the command that you use in Zen, that's why I call it that. Uh, basically, you tell the, the Zen kernel, give this machine more RAM, temporarily. So you're not changing the stock configuration, you're saying temporarily give this machine more RAM. If the underlying guest knows how to see hot pluggable RAM, it should detect that and just work. Um, because Joseph's machines were having out of memory errors, we ended up having to reboot his machines. But had his, had his machines not been not been so hammered, we would have been just fine by uploading the RAM and then telling the Linux kernel on his guest, hey, there's more RAM. And it would have worked, would have worked just fine. Yeah. All right, so once we've got our machine up, this is our DOM zero. Wrong keyboard. So there are a few things we can do to notice uh, if we're working with a properly configured Zen DOM zero. The very first thing you want to do is make sure you're running the proper kernel. Actually, we only need one. Minus R. There we go. We're running 2.6.18-8.el5zen. Usually when you build a Zen kernel, you put in your extra version information, the word Zen somewhere, so you know you're running the proper kernel. Um, there's also another way you can do this. And this is the one that I found that is completely clash platform. There are other ways of doing it that work just distribution specific. If you're running the daemon, I have to grep for the ZD daemon. My bad. If you are running the ZenD daemon, then you are probably running a system. All right, let's say you have a system and you want to see if it actually is a candidate for virtualization. You want to see if you've got 
the uh, Intel virtualization technology or AMD virtualization technology? There are a couple ways you can do that. The easiest and most cross-platform <laughs> you look for the VMX CPU extension or CPU flag. So cat proc CPU info red VMX. If you see that flag in your CPU, one, two, three, four. Oh, this is a one of our dual core boxes. I thought this was a quad core. Okay. Well, I lied to you. This is one of our dual dual core CPUs. Um, anyhow, it is the VMX. Uh, it has the VMX flag, which means it can do full virtualization. All right, once we've got that running, we look at installing a guest. This is probably the, uh, the trickiest part of the whole endeavor. There are various different camps on how is the proper way to install a guest OS or a DOM U. Um, Originally, you had to manually bootstrap the system. So you had to find a disk image of the distro you wanted to run, tar it all up into a tarball, dump it to an image. Um, if you were running Debian, you could run dev bootstrap into a Cheroot. Uh, there's a, an RPM strap script that does essentially the same thing that dev bootstrap does, except it uses a, a, a Yum repository. But that was, the, that was the old way of doing things. Very difficult, kind of pain in the butt, because after you bootstrapped your system, you had to replace quite a bit of the guts of your guest system. You had to replace the initRD, you had to replace the kernel, you had to replace the libraries and modules. Um, when you were using Zen 2.6, you had to disable uh, LTS, local thread storage, I believe is what that's called, uh, because there, it wasn't Zen safe. So there was a lot of headaches in the early years of Zen, or the early months, I guess. TLS, TLS Thread Local Storage, excuse me, TLS. Um, and that caused a lot of grief. Uh, Zen 3 came along, which made things a little nicer. You didn't have to worry about uh, TLS. But you still have that bootstrapping issue. And uh, various different distros with their implementations of Zen have come up with various little tricks to get around the bootstrapping issue. Uh, SUSE, as I understand it, uh, modifies the guest and has drivers for the guest. I just found out about this yesterday. I'm not a real big fan of SUSE, but SUSE Enterprise Linux, I believe it's SUSE Enterprise Linux 10. Was it uh, Jordan or? It's probably uh, Stephen Shaw. Maybe it was Steve. Steve was the one who was telling me about it. Stephen was the one who was telling me about it. Um, uh, they've got uh, drivers now. Since Linux Enterprise 10, I believe, is the, is the uh, has drivers now for a fully pair of virtualized Windows, full, fully pair of virtualized Red Hat Enterprise Linux, fully pair of virtualized CentOS. So, SUSE has gone the route of let's make it easy for everyone, which I'm rather impressed with. Uh, Red Hat. What they do when they test their Zen stuff is, uh, okay, our DOM, our DOM zero is working. Can we install Red Hat on it as a DOM U? Yes. Check. Done. Um, so Red Hat makes it uh, easy and very easy to install a guest if the guest is Red Hat. In other words, it's the Henry Ford school of business. Right? You can have any color model T you want as long as it's black. You can have any distro of uh, uh, Linux on a uh, Red Hat Enterprise DOM 0 as long as it's Red Hat Enterprise Linux. That is using the Red Hat Enterprise Linux tools. You can use uh, compile from scratch Zen uh, and do things manually using the Zen supplied tools and get other distros to work. It's a little bit more work. Uh, SUSE, on the other hand, has all the, the check marks that they have to do. They have to have RHEL working, they have to have SUSE working, they have to have Ubuntu working. They have all these other distros that they have to get working before they check off that Zen is finished. So that's kind of cool. All right, let's talk a little bit about how we manage installing a guest. The hardware, bootstrapping. 
Yes, question. I, I just wanted to wrap up that comment you made. You feel that CentOS did the best job of making their guest installation process easy for the end user? If it is, CentOS. Okay. So if, if you're doing Red Hat Enterprise Linux on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, oh, I got that. it's I got a that. walk in the park. Okay. It's a normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill installation you can see in just a moment. But versus Ubuntu? If you're doing Ubuntu on top of Red Hat, with, with their tools, it's not going to happen. I mean, I mean as the host. As the host. As the host? I've not done, I haven't experienced a lot with Ubuntu as the host OS, as the Dom Zero. I haven't experienced a lot with uh, SUSE. I'm going to start, start looking at SUSE because of that. Um, but uh, as far as the host and guest relationship, SUSE has done it right in regards of, yes, every other distro is happy to play in our playground. Red Hat has done the model of the school of business. CentOS is just what you're Cent used to. CentOS is what I'm used to and what I'm most familiar with, so I'm uh, I'm sticking with that. Cool, thanks. Yeah, for the for the future of anyhow, because I've gone through the headaches of getting all the other distros to to work. So, all right. So let's look at um, how we install a guest. You can bootstrap it yourself, create a disk image, mount the disk image, copy all the directories and files in there. Mm, I don't like to do that. So what I'm going to show you is a tool that Red Hat has created. Or no, this one is actually the Zen tool. Called oh, Vert Install. It's a command line tool that basically just asks you a bunch of questions. And yes, you can pass every one of the questions it asks you as an option on the command line, and it won't ask you any questions. So you can fully script this. Vert-install, it says, you want to run a fully virtualized guest. So at this point, you would say, yes, I want to run a fully virtualized guest if I were trying to run Windows or Mac OS or what have you on top of my system here. Because I'm running Red, uh, Red Hat Enterprise, or excuse me, CentOS, oh, pardon me. Because I'm running CentOS, I'm just going to choose no. That gets me two things. That makes it uh, much easier to install. All I need is a uh, kickstart excuse me, all I need is a Yum repository, and uh, I can use Kickstart to install my machine. Number two is I get better performance. Para-virtualized systems get better performance because they are aware that they're virtualized, and they'll schedule their activity accordingly. Fully virtualized systems <coughs> assume that they have full unrestricted access to the machine, therefore they get blocked while something else happens until their piece of, of code executes. So we'll choose no there. We'll give it a name. Let's call this one class underscore demo. How much RAM? Let's give it 500 meg. What do we want to use as the disk? All right, this is another big question. What do you want to use as the disk? This is probably the most important question you have to answer when you're creating a guest. You can just throw a flat text file somewhere on your file system in here as the argument, and it'll create a sparse file. Works pretty well. Downsides is that your guest is now married to that host. Another downside is that if the DOM zero has a lot of disk I.O. going on, or runs out of swap space, or what have you, your performance will start to suffer. I like to separate them into, uh, if, I, if, I'm not, if I don't have any problems with my guest being married to a piece of hardware, I'll just run it on top of a, a LVM physical volume. I'll create a new, excuse me, logical volume. An LVM logical volume, I'll just create a new a logical volume in my volume group and use that as my physical drive. So it can use partitions and devices. If you truly want a redundant fairly bulletproof system, you need to have your guest disk residing on some sort of network storage. We're currently uh, migrating to a system uh, called CoRate. It's a very inexpensive, very useful, very powerful ATA over Ethernet platform. It's a fill as you grow. So you buy the enclosure, which comes with the caddies, 
the, the enclosure is fully loaded with caddies in the head unit, and you just buy drives as you need them and uh, plug them in. And it's APA over Ethernet. It's pretty slick. You have to worry about network infrastructure and so forth, but all the other things you have to worry about when you do any sort of network attack storage. Um, if you already have some sort of SAN system, just attach a LUN and use the LUN as your disk storage. Why do you want to go through the hassle of doing that? The number one reason you want to go through the hassle of doing that is so that you can migrate this guest you're creating to another host. There's only one other caveat apart from having the network attached storage as my disk image. This host and the host I am migrating it to need to be on the same layer two segment. Reason for that is so that the MAC address is translated appropriately. The MAC address of the guest. So if you're using bridged Ethernet connections through your host into your guest, and you move it to another machine on the same segment, your switch will get a little confused for a few packets and realize, oh, he's answering on this port now, and the traffic will go down to the, uh, the other guest once you do your migration. That tends to be in the order of 10 to 400 milliseconds on average. So it starts transferring the memory contents over. Uses a copy on write algorithm to make sure that it gets all the, all the changes. Pauses execution for 10 to 400 milliseconds after it's finished copying it, and then brings it up on the other host. Very, very slick. I was just going to say there's one other thing to be aware of, and that's the architecture. It's easily overlooked in terms of 64 bit non zero. Yeah, you need to make sure that your host architecture match. And uh, that's something that, that uh, I didn't mention in the beginning. If you're going to build a big Zen farm, a big vir if you're going to build any sort of big virtualization farm, whatever be the, the virtualization technology, your hardware should match fairly closely. Uh, number one thing you want to get is uh, the uh, architecture. You want to have similar specs as far as, as uh, disk space and memory space and so forth. And you also want to take into account the amount of load on each host. If you've got one node that's running at 100%, or excuse me, one node that's running at 80%, and another node that's running at 40%, and node two goes down, you've got a very bad situation. In other words, you probably need to plan for n plus one redundancy. In other words, your total load should be uh, n minus one of all your hosts. Does that make sense? So if I have X number, of, if I have you know a total of 32 gigs across all of my nodes of storage, I need to have no more than the. Uh, I need to be able to migrate the guests from one host to another. And I need to have enough spare space on all the other nodes so I can migrate my guests. So that's another thing you need to look at with architecture planning. All right, so let's look at how we're going to create the disk. I did not create a logical volume for that, so I'm going to do this right now. I'm going to give it 10 gigs. I'm going to give it a name called class out of volume group zero. Looks like it got created. So we'll use dev vg0 class. Would you like to enable graphic support? This is another one that's a, that's not really an important question, but it's kind of a cool question. There is a VGA video driver that the, uh, the Zen system provides to the, uh, a VGA device that the Zen system provides to the guest. It's currently very immature, and you'll see some of the artifacts of that in just a moment. However, if you want to do a full GUI install, you can. If you're just running a web server on your guest, you really don't need to, and you can do a text install. Because we're doing text installs anyhow, I figured we might as well tell it no. And then what is the install location? You need to give it a, a, a URL of a kickstart server. So what we're going to do here is we're going to put HTTP colon slash slash thing dot demo. 
nerdblock.com/repo, which is a Kickstart uh, server I set up previously on the host, just to make it look back now. It'll start the install. It goes out and downloads phase one of the Anaconda installer. Phase one of the Anaconda installer gets past a couple of options telling you look here for your Kickstart or your, your system. And then those of you who've done a text-based install previously will notice that this is pretty familiar. I'm going to walk through real quick and just set up a uh, network 10.1.0.21. My name's over. 